Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. We are joined today by Mark Jackson of Cambridge Quantum Computing, and we are very excited to talk to Mark because he has this real gift for taking very complex ideas and distilling it down so that even Thomas and I can understand it. So, Mark, why don't you walk us through your education, your background, and what it is that brought you specifically to quantum computing? Sure. Uh, so first, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you guys and uh, and your audience. Um, I love quantum computing. It's, it's so incredibly exciting. This is one of those historic moments in technology that they'll be talking about uh, for a long time. And, uh, and we're, we're able to see this firsthand. Um, so my path was kind of a zigzag into this. Uh, this wasn't what I saw, set out to do, but, uh, but I'm very fortunate that that I ended up here. So I have a pretty traditional academic background. So I did my undergrad work at Duke. Uh, I majored in physics and math. And then I got my PhD at Columbia University in New York, where I specialized in superstring theory. And, uh, and that's a quantum theory of gravity. Some of you might remember that uh, Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory yep. does string theory. So that's usually the, the context <laughs> in which I talk about it. Um, I. <laughs> I, I, at, when I first saw the show, I didn't see why it was funny. That was just my normal day-to-day -day job, but um, <laughs> I've, I've grown to really like it. And so, uh, so I did string theory, and I did postdocs at Fermilab in Chicago, Leiden in the Netherlands, and then Paris at, at the University of Paris. And uh, so that's about 10 years that I, I did research after my PhD, and I loved doing research in this, and I, I loved physics, but towards the end of that, I did start to wonder if, if maybe there were something more to life, and, uh, and there, there's not many permanent academic jobs. And so towards the end, I, I kind of thought I should be doing something else, and I, I actually I didn't know what that would be. Um, there's not... When you're, when you're an academic, there's not a clear trajectory uh, if you leave what, what you want to do, and I hit upon this idea of doing science fundraising um, because no one had ever done it. And this was 2014 and Kickstarter was just starting. And so I had this idea that I would start my own science fundraising business. And so I moved to New York and I did this. And for about two and a half years, I ran this business. And it, in, um, it was a lot of fun. And we solved a lot of problems. We got, we got funding for several projects, but I just couldn't live off it. And uh, I, I couldn't sustain it. And so kind of reluctantly, I realized I had to get a real job again. And so I, I moved to San Francisco and I took a data science boot camp course offered by a company called Metis. And it was in that course that I first heard about quantum computing. Um, it, it wasn't a quantum computing course. It was just a normal data science course. But I, I started to learn about the developments. This would have been spring of 2016. And so um, like, like Google, I remember reading about their machine. And this wasn't a thing when I was a student. Um, there were there were academic researchers working on quantum computing, but no one no one would have predicted that it that it would, be, it would be commercially viable so quickly. And so I was really excited about this, but I didn't have a background in quantum computing, and I didn't really know anyone in the field. And so I was I struggled to to try to find a job in that field. Um, fortunately, I was hired as faculty at a place called Singularity University in Mountain View, California, and. So I was uh, I was glad to have a, a real job again, and I prepared lectures about quantum computing and other technology and science, and I wrote articles and and led little workshops and stuff, and so I I could kind of dip my toe in the water and I learned a little bit about it, but I quickly realized I missed being a part of the field. I was talking about it, but I wasn't really part of it. Real real quick, are there co sure. colleges right now that offer degrees in quantum computing? So. I think there are starting to be. I can't off the top of my head think of any, but I think there are starting to be certifications like there's these MOOCs, these online courses. I think um, I think that they now offer certifications and I, I believe IBM has some 
certificates you can get if you do some amount of training. So yeah, um, and, and none of this existed four years ago when I first started hearing about it. Yeah, we've been um, we've been having yeah. this debate about um, the competition between certifications and college degrees because the certifications are way cheaper, and it looks like the, that might be an end around in the tech world for for lots of people who want to uh, move up quicker. A- absolutely, um, for my boot camp, for example. I already had a PhD in physics. Uh, I wasn't looking to go back to school, but talking to employers, I realized that they were a little suspicious of me as an academic, that my skills wouldn't really translate to the real world. And so I signed up for this 12 week, I think it was boot camp, to kind of refresh myself on programming and to learn some practical skills. And part of the boot camp was job training. Uh, they practice interviews and they connect you with people. Um, recruiters would come to our class and, and kind of pitch their company to us. So yeah, it was it was a perfect way to kind of come up to speed uh, to, to try to get one of these data science jobs. Even though I didn't, I wasn't necessarily looking to become a data scientist, but at least kind of bring myself up to speed on all these type of skills. So when did and, you when did you run into Cambridge Quantum Computing? Then? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so so I was I was at Singularity and I kind of missed being a part of it and. I had become friends with a math professor at Berkeley, uh, Edward Frankel is his name, and we had dinner and I asked him if he knew of anyone in the quantum computing field. And he he made two introductions the next day over email. And one of them was to the founder and CEO of Cambridge Quantum Computing, Ilias Khan. And it was perfectly timed because they were, right then they were starting to think about hiring someone in the US. And to, to now segue into to a little bit of background about our company, Cambridge Quantum. So it uh, it started in 2014. So at that point, it was three years old, and they had about 40 people, all in the United Kingdom. Um, it was actually, so our, our founder, Ilias Khan, uh, he was chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And it was Hawking who suggested to him in 2014 that quantum computing was probably going to take off, and this would be a good business to get into. So we're very fortunate that that Stephen Hawking indirectly led to the the founding of our company, and so they were uh, yeah they were starting to think about setting up a U.S. presence, and so my introduction was perfectly timed. I was living in the Bay Area. I had a physics background. I had some business background, and I, I came introduced through a friend, and so so I was hired soon after that, and I I didn't even have a definite job description. Uh, they hadn't advertised it. They hadn't sat down and thought about what they needed, but it was some mix of science and business and networking and and such. And so, so, so you were the so quantum guy. Just I was the quantum guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And it and it was perfect. Uh, if I could have had my dream job, this would be it because it was a mix of everything in my life: the science and the business, and um, and it was it was great to finally be a part of it. And so that was three years ago. Uh, I joined in in September of 2017, and. Since then, we have grown so much, um, both as a company and as a field. Uh, I remember when I joined and I told uh, friends and family and, and academic colleagues that I had done this, and many were kind of skeptical. Is quantum computing a real thing? Do they really exist? Is, is, uh, are you sure? And, um, <laughs> and I, I said, no, no, it's, it's real. I've been reading about this. There's really stuff being done. And, and in three years, that's completely turned around. Uh, it, it's like every week there's some major technological advance, there's a new startup getting funded, there's some new commercial engagement that we hear about. Uh, it, it, it's tough to keep up with the news, to be honest. Um, I would guess that's most of your job is just keeping up with the news right now. Absolutely. Um, so how much, did, how much did things change when suddenly Google announced uh, quantum supremacy? Yeah, that was... That was quite an announcement. Um, so, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, quantum supremacy is a term, um, and and some feel it's a bit controversial, but it's just a term that uh, it's a milestone that a quantum computer can do something that a classical computer cannot. And it's it's not everything; it's just one thing, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a useful thing. It's just one example of something that a quantum computer can do better than a classical computer. And so Google had been working on this, this project for some time. And uh, funny enough, we actually got hints of it about a month before it was officially published because one of the servers that it was uploaded to uh, by, by a collaborator at NASA uh, was public. And so I think within an hour of it being uploaded, 
most of the community knew about this, uh, that they uh -huh. were going to make this announcement. And so, of course, people joked that clearly NASA had not discovered aliens because they're not very good at keeping secrets. <laughs> you would have heard about it by now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they did officially publish this, um, and it was a big milestone. Um, so they, they found one specific example of a problem that they could do on a quantum computer much, much faster than a classical computer. And, and there was a, a little bit of controversy about it, like, oh, well, maybe, maybe a supercomputer could do this um, at about the same speed and everything, but that's not a very strong argument because a classical computer, uh, you know, goes according to Moore's law. So even if you, let, let's say, doubled the power of the classical computer, uh, which which might take a year or two, a quantum computer doubles in power every time you add just one qubit. And so going from 50 qubits to 51 qubits doubles it. That may not sound so dramatic, 50 to 51, but but that's how it works with a quantum computer. And so if you're anywhere near what a classical computer can do, you will quickly overtake it. So it, this was an important milestone, and and I think people accept that now. And so that was that was kind of the the official uh, turning point that this is serious and people need to pay attention to this. So this this leads to the question of uh, there was this Bill Cosby bit that he was doing a long time ago and about Noah's Ark. It, it says, must have been a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago, and he gets to the point of of saying, "Okay, what's a qubit?" <laughs> yeah, so um, so a qubit uh, is short for quantum bit, and and the reason that we call it this is is kind of an analogy with an, how a normal computer works. So normal computers work with bits, uh, with, which stands for binary digit. So that's just a fancy way of saying ones and zeros. So everything on a computer at the most basic level is just a one or a zero, and that includes both numbers but also pictures and sound and video and, and us chatting right here, the way that a computer understands it is just ones and zeros or on, on and off switches, which are, which are processing very quickly. And that actually hasn't changed in 200 years. If you look at the original computer designed by Babbage at Cambridge, coincidentally, it's still just on and off switches. So the, the way that uh, these calculating machines handle information and, and do calculations hasn't changed at all in 200 years, except with quantum computers. That's the first change in the way that you actually process information. The way that a quantum computer processes information uses these quantum bits, which can be one and zero at the same time. So, so normal bits are one or zero, one or the other. Quantum bits can be both at the same time. And it's, it's sometimes likened to a coin so a coin has a head side and a tail side. If you put it on a table, it's, it's going to be heads or tails, one or the other. But a quantum bit or qubit is sort of like a spinning coin. It's sort of in this weird combination of both. Um, it doesn't have to be equally in both states at the same time. So often it's, it's weighted closer to a one or, or closer to a zero. And you don't get to know what, what the answer is until the very end. So, so we say that it's left in a state of superposition where it truly is in both states at the same time until the very end, when you measure the qubit, you force it to choose, are you a one or are you a zero? And then it becomes like a normal bit. It's just a one or a zero, but that's only at the very end. Now, why would we ever do this? Why did we come up with qubits and, and think about such weirdness like superposition? <laughs> the reason is because if a qubit is in this superposition of being a one and a zero at the same time, it's like it can solve two problems at once. And so that means that you don't have to consider the one case and then the zero case sequentially, which takes twice as much time as, as just considering one of them. If you use a qubit, you solve two problems at once. And if you had two qubits, you would solve four problems at once. And three qubits solves eight problems at once and so forth. So it multiplies. Every qubit that you include doubles the number of configurations. So by the time you have 30 qubits, that's a billion combinations that you're looking at simultaneously. And with 300 qubits, that actually corresponds to the number of configurations possible if you had every atom in the universe to make a computer from. Wow. So that means that even in principle, if you took the whole universe and you made a computer, that would correspond to just 300 qubits. So even in principle, you couldn't build anything more powerful than that.
But if you could build a quantum computer of 300 qubits working perfectly, that's how powerful it would be. And so that's why people are so excited about this. It's not just another faster computer like, like iPhone 8 compared to iPhone 7. It's so different that it could solve problems that we never could have even hoped to have touched before. And we, and we can talk more about what those applications are in a moment, but, uh, but that's how different this is. So it's not just a faster computer. It's completely different. So what you're saying is when the company um, D-Wave announced that they have a thousand qubit machine, that that's kind of bogus right now? So I, I wouldn't say it's bogus at all. So th the approach that D-Wave uses is different from the approach used by the, the other platforms like, like Google, IBM, Honeywell, Microsoft, and such. Um, so all of those use an approach which is called gate-based quantum computing. And so that means that you can control each qubit individually and you control it using operations or gates. You have the qubit go through different gates, uh, we say. And so with D-Wave, they use something called quantum annealing or simulated annealing. And, and they are called qubits, but you don't get to control them individually. What you do is you encode your problem in the couplings between the qubits. So when, when the qubits are, are physically connected in a certain way. And so you encode your problem in the couplings between them, and then you tell the machine to find the lowest energy configuration, or relax, we say. And based on the couplings that you've set, that lowest energy configuration will be the solution to your problem. And I sometimes say it's sort of like a Ouija board where you, you set up the pro problem, you ask your question, and then it kind of Almost, almost like magic, it finds the answer. It spells out what the answer is. Um, of course, it's not magic, so there is a reason for this. And it's an incredibly fast computer if you happen to be solving that one type of problem that it can do. So it's like a very specialized computer. It's a bit controversial about whether it's quantum or not. Um, there's, some, there's some controversy about that. But, uh, but regardless, it's, it's a very fast specialized computer, certainly. All right. Well, there's obviously this competition going on between lots of companies trying to uh, build the biggest quantum computer machine in the world. Um, it's it's fascinating to me because we don't know what you can do with a quantum. The, the average person doesn't know what you can do with a quantum computer that you can't do with a regular computer. Um, is that something you can enlighten us on? Sure. And, and that's a very good question. And I get asked this a lot. What does a quantum computer do? What is it good for? Um, why can't we just wait a few years and have a faster normal computer do those things? So uh, first of all, I want to clear up a misunderstanding, which I've heard a lot. Um, you can't simply take a program from a normal computer and run it on a quantum computer and expect it to be a million times faster. That, that's not how it works at all. The software for a quantum computer has to be written specifically for a quantum computer. Uh, so you, you would need someone trained in quantum physics and familiar with quantum computing and how you program them. And a, and a simple example illustrates why. The basic ingredient in a normal computer program is the if-then statement. If something is true, do this. If it's false, do something else. And so a computer program is really just a very sophisticated network of if-then statements making decisions. But a quantum computer has qubits, which are, are one and zero on and off at the same time. And so how does it do an if-then statement? Because it would have to do both. It's like that, that Yogi Berra saying, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> you would literally have to do both things. And so, so a, a quantum computer can't do that, of course. And so the logic behind quantum computing is very different. You have these qubits, which are, are coupled. You perform operations of qubits, which may depend on the values of other qubits, but you don't get to know the answer until the very end. So this creates what we call entanglement. So the answer of one qubit may depend on the value of another qubit, and it could be a very complicated series of, of uh, interconnections between the values of those qubits. But at the very end, you measure them, and you'll get some answers, which are ones or zeros for each of those qubits, and that's all you get. You don't get to peer into the, the inner workings of what those qubits were uh, during the program. So, uh, so yeah, so the logic is, is very different. So what do you do with this? Why do we go to all this effort of making qubits and programming them and such? About 40 years ago, this, this very famous physicist named Richard Feynman, he was thinking about chemistry. 
And you, you think that we know everything there is to know about chemistry. Um, and, and in some ways, that's true. We've known what the equations are for, for chemistry, for molecules, for about 100 years. But those equations are very complicated, and there's a lot of them. So, so when I talk about chemistry, so you have a molecule. So the skeleton or the backbone of a molecule is made of protons and neutrons. And they're very heavy, and they don't really move much. The electrons are swirling around them in sort of this cloud-like pattern. And it's very complicated what that pattern is because the electrons are attracted to protons, but they're repelled by other electrons. And so you have this, this complicated series of equations of what the electrons are supposed to do. And every electron, of course, has all these interactions with all the other electrons. So the more atoms you add to the molecule, the more electrons are in each one. And so you get this, this huge matrix of equations which are all depending on each other. We've known what those equations are for 100 years. There's no mystery in that. But solving them is very complicated. And if it's a small molecule, and it's, it's certain cases where the equations kind of decouple or, or they become independent in some sense, then you can solve it on a normal computer. And, and we've done that for decades now. We have some good approximations for solving these equations uh, in some cases. But what Feynman realized is that the really interesting cases, uh, the large molecules for the really uh, sophisticated interactions between the electrons, those would never be solved by a normal computer, ever. Even if you wait a few years and the computers become more powerful and we have Moore's law, which says they, they double in power every 18 months or so, if you think about that compared to how difficult it is as these molecules get bigger, it would never catch up. We would never have uh, normal computers powerful enough to study the, the really interesting cases. So he realized this 40 years ago. And he's, uh, he's a really smart guy. He didn't just complain about that problem. He thought of a solution to it. He said, well, these equations are quantum because that's how nature thinks. Nature is a fundamentally quantum uh, calculator. And so we need to build a calculator which uses this. We need to build a calculator which is intrinsically quantum and, and does quantum calculations. And so that was the, the birth of this. Now, 40 years ago, there wasn't an obvious way of how to do this. This was sort of like Star Trek technology. Uh, well, let's just build little calculators using quantum physics. There you go. <laughs> uh, no, no one knew, obviously, how to do this. And so there were, of course, some ideas, and researchers started working on this. And the joke was that it was always about 10 years away. Research there, right. were, there was academic research in this, but no one had actually come up with a commercially viable, scalable quantum computing roadmap. And it was about six years ago, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, that things started to change. That people started to see a roadmap for commercial viability. And so, so that was a, a long-winded version of uh, of telling you that chemistry is is an obvious application. Now, why would we want to solve these chemical equations? Um, yeah, why would we go to all the effort of, of doing this? When we do medicine, when pharmaceutical companies are trying to design new drugs for people, it, it's a shockingly inefficient system. Uh, they, they basically have to do guess and check. So we, we understand some things about chemistry, but they basically have to kind of imagine how the drug will interact with your body and they have to uh, synthesize some samples. They have to test it on people. This all takes a lot of time. This takes a lot of money. It's risky for people who have to take it. Of course, um, you know when they, when they do these studies, like like what they're doing right now for COVID, they they have to check what the side effects are. And sometimes it does have adverse effects on people. And even if they are successful, even if what they're studying does lead to um, uh, improved health for some people it won't have the same effect on everyone. People have different genetics and they, they react to different medicines differently. And so even if some people respond well to it, some people may not respond at all to it and some people may have bad side effects to it. And so what the pharmaceutical company is trying to do is maximize the effectiveness and minimize the side effects for the general population. They can't worry about one person individually. They need to worry about the effect on the whole population. And so, um, so yeah, that's why it's so lengthy and expensive and risky. Now, imagine if you could design a drug for someone. So if, if they had some condition, you could 
learn about their genetics and you put this on a computer and you ask the computer, design a medicine for this person for, to treat this condition and minimize the side effects just for them. That would be incredible. You would have this personalized medicine to maximally benefit that person and minimize the side effects for them. And so that's what we could do. If we had a magic wand with chemistry, that's what we could do. We could have a computer program that designs personalized medicine. There's no way we could have done that with a normal computer. But we think that we could do this with a quantum computer, not next week, but maybe 20 years from now or something. That's that's what we could do if, if we had enormous chemistry ability. Okay, so I want to get into this question of the applications of quantum computing. And I want to approach it from two different vantage points. The first is just the general question of what are the characteristics of a domain that is a good candidate for solution with a quantum computer? And the second is looking specifically at quantum machine learning because I'm a machine learning engineer. I find quantum computing very interesting and I have a lot of friends who are machine learning engineers and they also want to know kind of how to get into this. So let's take the first one first. Chemistry is, is kind of an obvious place to start because it's, it's quantum mechanical in nature and quantum computers are quantum mechanical in nature. But is there a, a, a general characteristic for these fields that people want to apply quantum computing towards? So ones that I heard were meteorology, natural language processing, uh, artificial intelligence, a few others. So is it just a matter of being really complicated or is it a matter of being isomorphic in some way to a quantum system such that there are entanglements between the, the parts? I mean, there are a couple different ways I could see parsing that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a very good question. And there are a few fields that we, we think would apply well to quantum computing. And, and you've mentioned several. So uh, AI, uh, which is built on machine learning, natural language processing, which is a special example of machine learning. In chemistry, we talked about the general solution to that, the, the general answer to that question of what can we use a quantum computer for? What types of problems are good on a quantum computer? We don't know. No one knows the answer to that yet. We know of a few examples of things that quantum computers are good at. Um, so, so I mentioned chemistry. The equations in chemistry are very good. We know that quantum computers are good at searching. If I give you a list of N items and they don't have any ordering to them, if, if I just kind of hand you a list of N items, on average, you would have to look halfway through that list to find the one that you're looking for, right? If you didn't know anything else about the ordering, on average, you would have to look halfway through. A quantum computer, you would actually only have to look through square root of N. And that that's really dramatic. If n is large, let's say n is a million, classically, you would have to look through half a million names on that list, say, to find the name that you're looking for. And that could take a long time. You would have to go through them one by one. With a quantum computer, you would only have to look a thousand times at that list. And, uh, and it's, it's a bit technical to explain why, but that was one of the first quantum algorithms discovered. And be because of this quadratic improvement in speed, it could be quite dramatic. Is that Shor's that, algorithm? Shor's algorithm, exa exactly. So, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Well, that's called Grover's algorithm okay. for searching. Uh, the second example I was going to give you was Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm is, is that quantum computers are very good at factoring large numbers into the primes that make them up. So, so for example, 3 and 5 multiply together to make 15. Now, that's a pretty simple example. Uh, if I give you 3 and 5, you can easily multiply them together to make 15. And if I asked you what primes need to be multiplied together to get 15, you could probably pretty quickly say it's 3 and 5. But if I gave you a really, really long number and asked you, well, what two prime numbers needed to be multiplied together to make that, you might have some difficulty with that. And you shouldn't feel bad because no one has ever come up with a fast way of doing that. No mathematician in history has found a procedure for doing that. You basically have to guess and check. Now, why would we ever care about prime numbers and factoring and, and, and things like that? 99% of the encryption methods that we use right now for, for uh, the internet and for cash machines and just general cybersecurity 
are based on that mathematical fact that multiplying primes is sort of a one-way door. It's easy to multiply them, but it's difficult to go the other way and figure out how to factor them. And so, um, so the fact that a normal computer would have a lot of difficulty does that, that's what keeps things secure. That's what prevents our credit card numbers from being intercepted online. But a quantum computer can apparently do this very quickly. And this was realized about 25 years ago by this, this professor at MIT named Peter Shore. At the time, no one had built a quantum computer that could do that. And so it, it was academically interesting. Um, it, it, so Shore provided a recipe. If we ever built a quantum computer, here's the instructions that you would give it to do this. So people thought it was of theoretical interest, but they, they didn't exist yet. So it, it presented no real danger to existing cybersecurity. But we're now seeing this, this is a real threat. So quantum computers today can't do it, but at the rate of progress that we're making, it could be in, in a few years. Um, and, and it's not to say that Shor's algorithm is even the most efficient way of doing it. He came up with one way of doing it, um, but it's sort of like the, the first explorer to reach some point, they found a way to get there. But as people start to do that, they'll probably find more efficient ways to do that. And, and people have already done that. So there's already improvements over Shor's algorithm. Um, and so, so, yeah, so these are just a few of the examples that people have been working on let, let uh, me, for, for quantum computing. Let me give you an example of, um, I've been speculating on this, this idea that most of our search being done today is, is text-based search. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that sometime in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to uh, have drones that are scanning cities, and we're going to have sensors that are embedded all over cities. And very soon, we're going to be able to um, create search engines for the physical world. So uh, sometime in the not too distant future, you'll be able to search on everything from smells to taste to harmonic vibrations to specific gravities to uh, textures to um, virtually every attribute you can start thinking of, we'll be able to search on it. And we don't have to know how the search engine is actually working. We just have to put in an inquiry of where is that dog with rabies right now? And then we'll be able to find that inside of a city. Is, is that something that a quantum computer would be able to do faster than traditional computers? It, it, it's possible. Um, so, so I mentioned Grover's algorithm um, for searching there's a few asterisks. Um, so it's it's searching, but in in very specific ways, and it's not clear that it translates into general purpose searching. Um, people are still figuring this out. So it's possible. Um, I just don't want to promise right now on this podcast that that's the case. <laughs> Uh, a money back guarantee, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. But 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 the fact that that there is such a dramatic improvement for some types of searching is promising. All right. All right. Good. Okay. So, with respect to the searching algorithms, it it sounds mm -hmm. like that's sort of one of the possibilities I laid out for a domain that would be good for quantum computing. So mm -hmm. that corresponds to complicated, and then. When we're trying to do something like predicting the weather, is that just because it's complicated or is it because the, the, the system has these components that are entangled in a, in a way that might be modelable with, with a quantum algorithm? Sure. sure. So, um, so the general story of, of machine learning for quantum computing, it's not clear. People still don't understand what, what the general story is. Quantum machine learning is actually a specialized subfield. So people are, are just now beginning to understand what quantum machine learning is. And the difference is that normal machine learning is based on probabilities. So you feed it data from past examples and you kind of teach the system how to do things. So you, you give it what the answers are and it gradually learns from those examples and then it's able to predict what the answers will be. And so it will assign probabilities for what it thinks the answers will be, right? Quantum machine learning is not based on probabilities. It's based on something called an amplitude. And an amplitude you can think of as, as like an arrow or a vector. And the critical difference is that probabilities are just numbers between zero and one, but amplitudes have a direction. So that's, that's why when I suggest you think of it like an arrow, the arrow has a head and a tail. 
And when you add these amplitudes or vectors together, you connect the head of one to the tail of the other. And so you, you have a direction for the resultant amplitude. And depending on the relative angle of the two amplitudes that you've added, they could add together to give a bigger answer, or they could cancel each other out if they were pointed in opposite directions. So you see that the mathematics is much more sophisticated with this type of, of quantum machine learning. And so that's why people are hopeful that quantum machine learning could see patterns and things that normal machine learning would have missed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about quantum machine learning because this, this is super fascinating. And, and I wanted to start off by saying natural language processing is a potential application for quantum computing that came up a Absolutely. lot. And I, I'm curious as to why natural language processing and not something like facial recognition or image processing, which are in, in terms of classical ML, fairly similar in the mechanics. Oh, good. So why have people started focusing on natural language processing and not, and not things like image processing? The simple reason is, is that right now, quantum computers are in what we call a NISC state. And NISC is an acronym, N-I-S-Q, for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. <laughs> and it's, it's a term coined by John Preskill of Caltech, um, I think in, in December of 2017 at the Q2B conference. And it kind of summarizes this idea of we have quantum computers, they exist and they do things. They don't have that many qubits and then the qubits have sufficiently large error that the program can't be very long before you would expect something to go wrong. So we can run programs, but they have to be small and not use many qubits. So what, why, why am I saying that? Natural language processing, if you only have a few words, you could do some sort of machine learning with the words. But for image processing, you probably need a lot of qubits. Images tend to be very large. And so I, I would guess that's why people have kind of started with that first. You could do more with f fewer qubits. But people definitely will start to use quantum computing for images and, and sound and things. So what are some of the major applications of machine learning, quantum machine learning, uh, besides natural language processing, some of the other things that we've mentioned. Are there any other areas that you're excited about? What do you, what do you expect yeah, to see? What's, the what's the holy grail? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I don't think, I'm not aware of any holy grail. Um, so people have come up with a few quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, they've tended to be uh, hybrid in that they, they still rely very heavily on classical computing. Uh, for, for the reason that I just mentioned, that quantum computers still aren't at the point where they can do most of the heavy lifting themselves. And so people have tried to be clever and, and come up with a hybrid routine where you give it a machine learning task and some of that is sent to the normal computer and some is sent to the quantum computer. And then it, they each do their calculations and then the results are synthesized and combined at the end. And so um, one of them is called VQE, or Variational Quantum Eigensolver. Um, there's another one called QAOA. Um, yeah, we, we probably don't need to get into <laughs> some of these examples, but um, uh, yeah, people are starting to develop these. And it's, it's amazing because you're, you're seeing the birth of this whole new field uh, in just a few years. Um, so unlike physics, where we've had hundreds of years to, to draw from, in, uh, in quantum computing, it's just the past few years we're inventing completely new ways of doing things that didn't exist before. So there's a there's a new TV show out on Apple TV called Next, and it's it's about uh, an AI um, that gets released into the wild, and it uh, um, it has the feature of having um, uh, uh, recursive self improvement is what they re refer to it as. So so it actually improves itself on, as it goes, and so it's constantly getting better and better. And, um, and naturally, it has evil tendencies, and so it wants to take over the world. And, and that's one of the big flaws in Hollywood is they like to turn uh, technology into the bad guy. And, um, and I, th I think that's very counterproductive uh, in the long run. But uh, it, in my mind, it, I always have to ask the question, well, why? Does it have some gene that says, yeah, I've got to take over the world, and, and, and then what after it takes over the world? But um, uh, so what can 
quantum AI do that regular AI cannot? Sure, and and I think you have a very good point. Um, why does Hollywood insist on characterizing AI as some sort of evil robot, like from the Terminator or something? I think when you say AI, people, they're fearful, and that's the image they have, and they they think, oh, it's a good thing that hasn't been invented yet. What most people don't realize is that AI has been around a long time, and it's not evil robots, it's Netflix. When Netflix makes a recommendation based on the movies you've watched, here's what we think you might enjoy. That's AI. So it's it's not evil robots, it's just algorithms which kind of learn from past behavior. And people use this all the time. When, when you go on an airplane, the autopilot is AI. And so uh, so it's, it's funny that people have this uh, misconception about that. So is it is it true that um, somebody's going to some evil guy's going to use uh, this advanced quantum system to suddenly mine all the cryptocurrency that's out there? <laughs> Good. So I'm I'm often asked that. Yeah. Um, so so quantum computing and cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. So there's there's two independent questions which sometimes people kind of conflate. So one question is, could you use a quantum computer to mine all the Bitcoin? And the answer is no, you couldn't. Oh, thank God. And the reason for this is the mining algorithm for Bitcoin, it happens to be something that quantum computers are not good at, or at least we don't think they're good at. And in fact, there was, there was an article done specifically on this topic, uh, projecting the rate of progress in quantum computing and uh, like the, the rate of, of being able to mine Bitcoin. And this is not an issue. There's no danger of quantum computing doing that. What is an issue is that many cryptocurrencies and blockchain, they rely on standard encryption methods, which could be broken by a quantum computer. And so this is why the past few years, there's been a strong tendency to move into what's called post-quantum encryption. And so this is a, a term which... Um, so earlier, I described that uh, that a lot of encryption is based on the difficulty of being able to factor large numbers. And, and that's unfortunate because quantum computers are good at that. So post-quantum encryption is when you have other mathematical problems, which we don't think quantum computers are good at. This is still under intense study right now. Uh, the problem has not been solved. Uh, there's actually a US government agency called NIST, which is actively investigating this right now. Uh, they're having a contest of sorts. People have submitted different post-quantum encryption algorithms and people have been doing their best to hack them. And then there's going to be some winners. And I believe right now there are seven finalists. I think a, a few months ago, it went from like 22 to seven. And um, so there will probably be a few winners. Uh, we, we don't know precisely what those are. And so cryptocurrencies or blockchain or what have you they will need to upgrade to this post-quantum encryption. Otherwise, they would be in danger of being hacked by, so, by a quantum computer. So so then you couldn't actually mine all of the, the Bitcoin, but you could steal it all. You could steal it, okay. precisely, <laughs> precisely. Awesome yeah. problem. All right. Um, just, just to close the thought, sometimes when this issue of post-quantum encryption and hacking from quantum computers comes up, People are cavalier. They say, oh, well, that's not going to happen for decades to come if it does happen. And they don't seem to understand that at the rate of progress, it could happen in just a few years, first of all. Second, it takes time to make that transition. It's not just like you install something and five minutes later, your system is, is now quantum secure. For complicated systems, it could take years to do that upgrade because you have all sorts of legacy systems and oh. such. And so this is why we've encouraged people to uh, to start the upgrade process right now. And third, there are rumors that some bad players or, or bad governments are archiving everything right now. So that in a few years, when quantum computers are sufficiently powerful, they can just read everyone's mail. And so that means even if, let's say next year, you upgrade your system, the government would have all of your email from today on their system. And, and maybe it's nothing, but it could be embarrassing or harmful if they could read your mail, even if it's a past email. And so, um, so, so there are several reasons why we're encouraging people to start upgrading their system right now. Don't wait until you've been hacked uh, because it's obviously too late by then. Hmm. 
So I want to ask some win questions. Um, it, it sounds like you're fairly optimistic with respect to how quickly we're going to see commercial applications of quantum computing. So if so, so that's one question. When do you think that's going to happen? And then for a person like myself who is in data science and machine learning, maybe wants to position themselves for that, is that a sensible thing to do? And, and what would that path look like? Sure. So I think, this is just my personal opinion, I think we could start to see commercial applications in as soon as two to three years. So right now we're already starting to do things that normal computers can't do. Um, they're not earth shattering yet, but they are kind of things that we couldn't quite do before. I think in two to three years, we could start to do interesting things that are commercially valuable. I think in 10 years, quantum computing will just be ubiquitous. It will be everywhere and, and an integral part of the system and it will do amazing things. And um, that's just sort of on the, the timeline that I've seen the past few years, but we're already starting to see things speed up. So for example, we've talked about Moore's law that normal computers double in power every 18 months or so. Quantum computing was sort of on a sped up Moore's law um, in which it was doubling in power every 12 months. And, uh, and, and in fact, IBM has, has very consistently been on that trajectory. They've doubled the quantum volume, which is, which is one metric for the quantum computing power. They've doubled that every year Honeywell, earlier this year, they came out with, with a new processor and they predict that they will be able to increase the power of fact, by a factor of 10 every year for the next five years. So that means in, in five years, their quantum computers would be 100,000 times more powerful than those they had this year. So is that just a matter of adding an additional qubit? So you said that it's, it's n squared for every qubit that you add. So it is doubling the power, does that just mean they're going to figure out how to entangle one additional qubit every year for five years? Or So, so it's, it's true that adding one qubit doubles the power. Uh, however, there, there's a few subtleties in that you also have to worry about the qubit quality because the, cu the qubits aren't perfect. Um, they, they are physical devices and, and they're sort of a noise and there's an error rate and people are working very hard on getting that error rate down. So adding another noisy qubit doesn't really do anyone any good. The trick is to add another qubit which has a very low error rate and which works in coordination with the other qubits. That's that's the tricky part. Um, that's the, the issue of does it scale? And so um, if you can do that, it's true. Adding just one qubit doubles the power. And so um, if, uh, yeah, if, if IBM and Honeywell, for example, if they can stay on the trajectory that they seem to be on, that would be incredible. So again, in five years, it would be 100,000 times more powerful. Now, just a few weeks ago, uh, a startup called IonQ unveiled a new machine in which they it, they claim this has a quantum volume of, I think it was uh, 4 million. And that would be incredible. This is several orders of magnitude higher than we thought. Right. Um, this hasn't been tested yet, um, but, but they're a very good group and I have no reason to disbelieve it. Uh, it's, it just hasn't been tested yet. And this is what they anticipate to come out in a few months. So, um, so we, we could even be several years ahead of the trajectory that we thought we were on before. So it's a very exciting time. So, so there's no real quantum computer language at this point. Is that correct? And so we, we may end up going without any language at all and just talk back and forth to our quantum computers. And, 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 and will it, <laughs> well, will that's it, the natural language will, it, will it be speaking in English? That's all I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, y yes and no. So, um, uh, no, there hasn't yet been a standardized quantum language. Um, each of the platforms that I've mentioned, Google, IBM, Honeywell, Microsoft, and so forth, um, they have their own intrinsic language that they've developed for that specific processor. They're very similar. Um, so mathematically, of course, uh, a, a quantum program is, is universal. So, so you could take the circuit diagram for a quantum program and move it from one to the other. Actually writing the program to get the quantum computer to do that is a little bit different depending on the platforms that you would be using. Uh, however, Cambridge Quantum has developed a compiler which works on all of them um, to, for exactly the reason that, that I think you were bringing up, that it's a bit of a hassle to translate it from one platform to the other. And so that's why we've, we've done this. We call it Ticket. So with Ticket, you just write your quantum program and if you want to run it on IBM's machine, fine. 
And then if, if you want to run it instead on Honeywell's machine, you simply change one line in the program, and now you can run it on Honeywell's. So all the details of the different quantum processors are built into the back end. So our, our scientists have worried about that so that you don't have to. And it includes all the things like which qubits are coupled to each other and the error rates and how many there are. And all those details are built in for you. You don't need to worry about that. So I, I kind of just thought of a, a left field question, which might be completely ridiculous. But is, is there any quantum mechanical equivalent of a Turing machine or an equivalent of like the Church Turing thesis that would say that if you write it in this way with the lambda calculus or whatever, that it will it, it can solve any computable problem? Yes. So there, there's an idea of a, of a universal quantum computer. Um, and and that is something that people are actively concerned about. Um, so we have these different quantum computers, and there's different technologies used to build each of them. Depending on the technology, some operations are easier to do than others. Um, so we, we say there are native gates. So there are some operations you can do on the qubits which are very efficient, and, and they have a low error rate. And others, they don't work as well. You kind of have to turn them into the... Uh, basic operations which are native and so there are some mathematical descriptions of this that that's okay you can take your quantum program from one platform and use it on the other um, there are some details about the specific technology but in principle you can simply move it from one to the other okay so for a person that wants to get into quantum computing do you think it's it, it sounds like we're in the relatively early days and it probably is important to understand the quantum mechanics at some level. So would it be better to take some graduate courses in physics or get your hands dirty with the IBM web interface uh, or use Ticket? Uh, what would you recommend a person? And, and is there the equivalent of the personal computer that you can buy for your home and experiment with? <laughs> can I get a sure. radio, so, radio shack quantum computer? <laughs> sure. So let me answer that last question first. Um, uh, there is not yet a, a personal quantum computer that you could use in front of you the same way that I'm using this laptop. What there is, is a um, cloud access. So most of the, the quantum computers that are being built, they're in laboratories and they have a lot of wires dangling around. Some of them have to be kept very cold, so they're specialized refrigeration equipment. And why do all of them look uh, like a chandelier? <laughs> uh, I, I yeah, so the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the superconducting approach to quantum computing, you have to so you have to keep the the quantum processor very very cold to to have the special quantum properties, and the way that they do that is they have a series of little refrigeration chambers kind of enclosed in each other almost like Russian dolls, and so to do that they have a a chandelier, which it gets colder at each layer. I see, mm -hmm. and uh, and so it looks very beautiful, but there is a, a a practical feature of that, yes. Um, so it's, it's kept at near absolute zero. Uh, other approaches don't have to be kept nearly as cold. Um, so, so yeah, even though it's not very practical to have one of those type of, of quantum computers in your home or office, fortunately, they've connected it to the internet. And so uh, even we, so, so we are developer partners with several of, of the ones that we've mentioned, um, we access it through the internet. We don't physically have to be at their laboratory fortunately. Now, a few of them, uh, for example, IBM, they've made it available publicly over the cloud. So for example, IBM's 5 and 16 qubit machines, I believe, you can log in right now. So literally open a browser, go to IBM's Q experience, create an account, and you will be able to use their quantum computer. Uh, you get some number of credits and you, there's a queue. There's a, a bit of a wait because there's a lot of people trying to do this, but you can run an honest to God quantum computer. You can write a little program and execute it. Um, the, the higher end ones, of course, there's a, a fee and, and a whole partnership program and, and developer program and such. But, um, but it's really amazing that already uh, the public can do this for free instantly from their browser. Um, so to answer your question about how would you learn how to do this? Um, there are several online courses, I believe. Uh, I haven't personally taken any, and so I don't want to recommend or, or vouch any. But, um, but from what I've seen, there do seem to be some certification programs and such. And so I would encourage people to do that and just play around with it. You can't break the quantum computer. Uh, well, at least, at least not 
using it from the browser. So you can't do anything wrong. <laughs> may not, you may not get the answer you want, but you can't break it. So uh, that sounds like don't a worry challenge. too much about that. Yeah. <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, this is um, very exciting. It seems like um, we're right on the edge of um, kind of an exploding startup community that's going to... Um, it, I, I would imagine that they first start building tools um, and 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 tools and techniques and things to to do things with, and and probably languages as well, um, and and then it kind of explodes from there. Uh, but there, there's like this foundational layer of things that need to be in place before um, uh, all these these things start growing on their own. That that's right. Um, it's it's sometimes been likened to like in the 1950s or 60s uh, because the computers are still pretty big. Yep. Um, so it's it's like those scenes where uh, the the IBM engineers have to come install this big mainframe in in a room in the business center, and only engineers know how to use it because uh, you have to use assembly language and everything, and and people are kind of wary of it. It is still a little bit like that in a sense that the machines are, are big and experimental. And you do have to have very specialized technical knowledge. In a few years, I don't think that will be the case. I think people will be using quantum computers, but they won't even realize it. So for example, um, if you go to Google Maps and you say, show me the shortest route from A to B, that would be something that you might use a quantum computer for. So Google would take care of it for you. They would have some algorithm which calls a quantum computer to figure out what the shortest route is, and then it sends it back to you. So I think I think in a few years it will be fully integrated into technology. Yeah, right. I think we've learned a lot since the 1950s as well about how to add abstraction layers so that you don't have to understand really what it is that you're doing. So in the 50s, you had to know how to tell the computer to allocate memory and to flip a bit somewhere. And the sooner you get away from having to do that, then the sooner this becomes ubiquitous and people are, are using it to solve all kinds of problems. Right now, we're still having to tell it flip a qubit. Yeah. 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 Ah. All right. Well... Um, we, we do need to ask you this, this crazy question here. Um, we, we, we warned you in advance, but, mm -hmm. uh, so we, we ask all of our guests, uh, the, the guy who invented the first clock, um, how did he know what time it was? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they knew what you, you would know what day it was, right? Because we've known that from the sun for for a long time, there was some arbitrary day of the week chosen. Um, no, but but they would have pretty accurate. Depending on the location of the sun, you would know pretty accurately what time it was, um, right? Um, yeah, yeah huh? like noon. It, I think I think formally you would, you would define that to be, uh, you know. It, highest point in the sky or, or and there's no such. shadow for a pole that's on the ground something like that pr pr precisely yeah um uh, so how, how did they decide on 11 30 <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's just kind of a funny question because um we 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 have some really bright people on here and and that's the one that stumps everybody so <laughs> uh, well they would yeah they had they had already chosen 24 hours and they knew what an hour was and they knew what a minute was and what a second was. And so I think based on that, you could pretty easily figure out what time it would have to be. Yeah. To fit into so, that. so part of this gets back to, I, I've actually done quite a few talks on, um, you know, when, uh, when we had the Greek civilization, we had several famous Greek mathematicians. We had people like Archimedes, Pythagoras, Euclid, a number of famous Greek mathematicians. But when, when the Romans came around, we didn't have any famous Roman mathematicians. And it wasn't because the Romans were, were dumber than the Greeks or anything. It was because of their numbering system. They used Roman numerals. Now, the, the reason Roman numerals are so inferior is every number was an equation, and that prevented them from doing any higher math. They didn't have the ones, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. Um, and so 
an entire civilization for hundreds of years was prevented from doing any higher math just because of the numbering system that they had. So I always like to ask this question of what systems do we employ today that are the equivalent to Roman numerals that are preventing us from doing great things? And I, I think there's, there's a lot of them out there. I, I like, just like our calendar system. Why does that make sense to only have 28 days in February? Um, it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I, so when I lived in Paris for one of my postdocs, I actually worked at the, um, the Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris. Uh, so this was actually the observatory where they first defined the meter. And so what they did was uh, in this room, in this observatory, they measured the distance between the North Pole and the equator, and they divided by 10 million. And that was how they first defined the meter, which in Latin means, of course, uh, the measure. And so I, I always liked going to that room, knowing that that was the birthplace of, of length. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah. interesting that we've worked our way around to this now because one of my favorite quantum computing experts is actually Michael Nielsen. He wrote a, a quantum computing textbook called Quantum Country with Andy Matishak, and, and he talks a lot about this, about cognitive media and exploratory and explanatory media and how you can craft the structure of a book or some way of interacting with information such that you just have insights that you couldn't otherwise have. And he's got this long Twitter thread where he speculates about how you might be a Roman mathematician using Roman numerals and arrive at concepts like multiplication and addition and, and algebra and things like that. Like what are the conceptual leaps you would have to go through and in even knowing what those things are, it's pretty difficult to reverse engineer what would be required for it. In, uh, in the book 1984, there's a lot of emphasis on the language that the government controls. Yep. Uh, they call it newspeak. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have a word for something, then you can't really have a thought about it. And so they use the example of free in that they do have the, the word free, meaning no cost, but they don't have the, the definition of like political freedom. And so, uh, so yeah, I, that was the first time I, I really started to think about, yeah, maybe there's limitations in, in what we would think are, are simple things like language, but maybe it leads to some consequences if we just can't even conceive of something if we can't uh, describe it accurately. So I, I did want to ask you one, one final question here on the, this idea of a quantum internet. It seems like the government now is moving towards this idea that, um, uh, that it would be better to establish a quantum internet and we have something like eight nodes around the country that uh, are going to be the basic hubs for, for that. Um, can, can you kind of step us through what you could do on a quantum internet that you couldn't do today? Um, I mean, I mean, I, is that really, sure. really fast on Amazon? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. So, um, so to start with, uh, what is meant by a quantum internet? So with a quantum internet, you're communicating quantum data itself. So you could, you could transmit one qubit from one place to the other. Uh, with, a, with a normal internet, what you would do is you could have a qubit, but you wouldn't be able to transmit. You could measure it and then transmit a bit, but you wouldn't be able to, to communicate the actual quantum nature of it. That would be lost in any sort of measurement process. Now, why would it be important to transmit the, the quantum information? With normal data, you, in principle, you have no way of knowing if someone is eavesdropping or interfering with it, right? Because all, all you get is ones and zeros. With quantum data, it's actually built into the laws of physics that if someone eavesdrops or, or interferes or does something to the data before you do, you're changing. They're, they're changing. The quantum data. Is it decoheres? Is that right? The it, it, collapses it, it, it collapses or it decoheres. Yeah, something happens to it. Um, it doesn't stay the same. And so this is really great for communication because it means that any sort of eavesdropping or, or um, alteration can be detected. There's no, there's no way to cheat that. Uh, you, you, it's fundamental physics. And so with a quantum internet, you could have truly unhackable communication. And, uh, and so the way that you do this is either with, with fiber optics, you communicate, you, um, you use photons, which you exchange over fiber optics, or over empty space, you could do this with satellites and lasers. And, and those have been done already. Um, so with fiber optics, it's, uh, it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, fiber optics aren't that hard to get, but they only work over short distances. 
uh, with, with lasers and satellites, you can do it over much larger distances, but of course, satellites are, are pretty expensive to get a hold of. And so, um, so the idea is that we could build a quantum internet and this would allow, uh, th there would be a few hubs and you could have truly unhackable communication. Is that the biggest use case for it? Is just that measurement problems mean you can prove that it has not been tampered with, but would we be able to leverage some of the properties of quantum mechanical systems to do other kinds of operations in the same way that we do with quantum computers? So, so you could probably, you could, you could also use the quantum internet to link quantum computers together. Um, I think that's, at least for now, that's kind of a secondary application. I think the main application now is that you would, you would have unhackable communication. So you said that with the standard internet, you can engage in quantum communication insofar as you measure a qubit and then you transmit a bit communicating the state of that. But could you entangle quantum systems and have a quantum internet? Not, not, not that classically. Uh, so that would, that would be uh, one of the, the shortcomings of a normal internet is that, yeah, any, any quantum thing like superposition or entanglement is lost. You can't do that uh, with, with a normal internet. But with a quantum internet, you could. It, it becomes more difficult over long distances, but yes, you could do that. So some people have speculated that uh, um, once we we start to really understand the properties of quantum computing, that the the current stock market that we're using today is in jeopardy. Is is that something on your radar screen, or how can we make billions of dollars with this? Yeah, <laughs> I I don't think it's in any danger. Um, <laughs> Trading algorithms are definitely an application of, of quantum machine learning. In fact, we have several uh, we have several collaborations going on right now with, with financial groups to do that. Um, I think right now things are still pretty preliminary, and even if they mature enough in a few years that people use that, I think if you just look at how how humans interact, um, yeah, I don't think we're in any danger of of having a perfect system governed by quantum machine learning. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. And so th there are a couple different ways you might be able to apply it to finance. It, it's not just the trading algorithms. It's also things like solving for the parameters to maximize the value of a portfolio. It, or exactly. Like that. That, that's the other one is optimization. Or, um, right, so yeah. I, yeah. So given some constraints and some free parameters, trying to, uh, to minimize or maximize some objective. Could you come up with a solution to something like the Black-Scholes-Merton formula for options pricing with uh, quantum computers that I mean that's probably a ridiculous question but it, there's no closed form analytical solution to something like that there are only approximations but I wonder if a quantum algorithm might not be able to just anneal to the lowest energy point and spit out an answer for an option price that's actually a perfect example and that is something under under intensive investigation because with the black scholes equation you have this randomness built into the equation so you have to run many right. simulations of it using something called Monte Carlo simulations and so what you're what you're actually doing is is searching. Um, so it's kind of the same reason that searches are quadratically faster. Uh, for for about the same reason, Monte Carlo simulations can be sped up a lot uh, in, with, with a quadratic speed up. And so, yes, uh, Black Scholes, qu quantum Black Scholes is something that people are actively investigating. Very nice. Okay. Well. I think that uh, that's plenty for our audience to mull over for now. Thanks very much, Mark, for stopping by and talking to us. This was very good. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was great talking with you. Well, uh, you're, you're a great sparring partner here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we asked you a lot of dumb questions, and you, you came up with great answers. So <laughs> I, I thank you very much for coming on the show. And this is um, absolutely brilliant. I think uh, it really helps put uh, uh, quantum computing in perspective. And really, it shows that uh, we're, we're right on the edge of something that's pretty profound. And I, th I think that's exciting. I, I think there's, there's so much that um, we're, we're going to uh, come, have come out of the woodwork in just a few months here that um, I, I think we're, we're going to be surprised at what, uh, what comes up next. So uh, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, thank you. And uh, have a great day here. I agree. Thank you, guys.